go ahead and sit down. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is going to be from Ephesians 1, verses 15 through 20. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for the, all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and a re re revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who, we, who believe? These are in accordance with the workings of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Thank you. Being created in God's image, we have this unique ability to feel joy, to uh, feel happiness, but also to feel pain and, and to be touched by the problems of those around us. And for example, when you see news come on the uh, TV or across the radio and, and you become made aware of, of something that happened somewhere else, you feel this pain sometimes in your heart, or sometimes you feel sick to your stomach. Just recent events over the holiday season, we heard about some Islamic group in Nigeria, and they beheaded some Christians in protest of uh, Christianity. And you hear that, and you say, oh, that's just terrible. And you know how that feels like, right? And if it wasn't that, it was two weeks ago, the Lord's Church there in Texas uh, that we heard about the shooter that came in and, and opened fire on, on, on Christians while they were eating the Lord's Supper just as we finished. And when you hear that, do you remember the pain you felt and just the, the, the reaction emotionally and spiritually? It's because we're made in God's image. We're, we're made to be empathetic and and we see the evil around us, and, and, and it causes grief. And, of course, just last week, uh, Kelly and Putterball and, uh, excuse me, um, Cody. Cody. Yeah, their poor baby. That, and I don't know if the update on it, I should have asked, but no real news. And so, but two weeks old with uh, meningitis is not expect to live. When you hear that, your heart just aches. Why is that? Well, I bring this up because we just ate the Lord's Supper. And sometimes we get so used to doing something over and over and over, our heart can become dull. And things that used to impact us and cause this emotional reaction just don't do it anymore. But if we were to have a, a news blurb about what happened on the cross... God's son was murdered. Murdered. That's what James, or excuse me, Stephen says when he talks about what the Jews did to Jesus. And if we saw a murder of a family friend and we heard about it, we would be really taken back. We would just be aghast. But it's so easy for our eyes to become packed full of other things that distract us that we lose sight of what's really important. Now, we ate the Lord's Supper, and let me just ask to test us, what did we think about? When we read the First Corinthian letter in chapter 11, where Paul is shaming the church because their eyes have become really dull and they turned the Lord's Supper into just a common social meal. He reminds them of this fact, that whoever eats the Lord's Supper, you proclaim his death until he comes. Verse 27, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner 
he or she himself will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. That's why it's so serious that we never allow our hearts to become dull and callous. And that leads us to the scripture that Quentin read for us. And I want you to open your Bibles and, and look at it with me in Ephesians chapter 1. Because that's where our thoughts will come from this morning. Where Paul has this prayer. And I just love the prayers of Paul. And it'd be a good uh, exercise for all of us. You just look up all the prayers that Paul uttered on behalf of his fellow Christians. But here in the book of Ephesians, he's writing to this church at Ephesus in Asia. Where he helped start there. And, and he, he, he hears about their faith in verse 15. And then in verse 16, he says, we don't cease to make mention or give thanks of you while making mention you in your prayers. And I don't think Paul's speaking hyperbole or exaggerating. We don't cease. He's continually praying for them. And when he utters his prayers, he's mindful of these Christians that he lived with for these several years and actually had to leave town for fear of his own life. But while he's thanking God for them, in verse 17, he says that he prays that God, the Lord Jesus Christ, may give you a spirit of wisdom of every of revelation, the knowledge of him. Then specifically, and here's going to be our lesson. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Now, your Bible might read different than that. But he says, I want your eyes of your heart to be open so you can see some things. Now, did you realize your heart has eyes? Well, it does. But he's not talking about, first of all, our physical eyes that just take in physical things around us. And, of course, he's not talking about our physical heart. It doesn't have literal eyes. But remember, Jesus said, you're supposed to love God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and even your strength. So we're speaking of a spiritual consciousness, a heart where, where they, you look upon things and they become your priorities. It's the things that consume you. And he says, I want your eyes to be opened, that you can see things that are really, truly important. Now, we have to understand the, the context of this. Paul's in prison. He's in prison at this time when he's saying this prayer because of preaching the gospel. Not only is Paul in prison, he's not praying for non-Christians. Now, that should be our prayer. I, I pray that God will open people's eyes of their, and their hearts so they will see God's word for what it really is and see Jesus for who he really is. But Paul's not praying for non-believers. He's praying for Christians. And that's significant, and we'll make a point on that, because he wouldn't be praying for this for Christians unless he knows it's an issue that we can all be afflicted with, and that's dull or closed eyes of our heart. Paul's in prison, but he's not discouraged. Paul's in prison, but he hasn't given up. Paul's in prison, but he has great hope. And that's what we're going to see in this lesson this morning. Really just two points. He wants their eyes to be open. And then the second point is, well, what does Paul want them to see? And then there are three parts of that. He wants them to see the great hope they have, the great riches of grace they have, and then the great power that they have. Because these things are all life-changing and keep us on the right course when our eyes are open. So let's look at the first thing where Paul says, I pray that your eyes might be open so you'll know the hope, the great, or the riches, and also the, the power. But there in verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be lightened so you may know what is the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory, and the inheritance in the saints. When he says open our eyes, he's talking about understanding. And we see that in the scripture that it's possible to see something and yet not understand it at all. When you go back to Matthew 13, Jesus addressed this issue with his disciples when they said, why do you talk to us in parables? Now remember a parable is a physical story that is thrown alongside a spiritual truth and the physical story illustrates the spiritual truth that you would never understand otherwise. And so they're saying, 
you know, Jesus, why do you teach us in uh, parables? And so that's in verse 10 of chapter 13 of Matthew. And in verse 11, Jesus gives an answer. He says, well, to you it's been granted to know the mystery of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not been granted. That's the other, just those that are not following him. For whoever has, to him it will be given, and who has an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing, they do not see. Did you catch that? It's possible to have eyes spiritually and still not yet see. And what he really means is to understand. So why would you say that? Because look what he goes on to say. While seeing, they do not see. And while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. So he says, in this case, the prophecy of Isaiah, because this has been a condition of mankind all throughout history. Isaiah is speaking some 17 years before Jesus came. He says, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You'll keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of these people has become dull. Did you get that? Their heart becomes dull. And they have closed their eyes, not physical but spiritually, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return, and I should heal them. See, this is a condition that can afflict all of us, that we could see something and yet not get it. I came across this story, and it's, it's a physical, it's my parable, all right? <laughs> and so back in the day, it's before, well, we we're transitioning from record players and eight tracks to CDs. Remember that? Well, it actually went to cassettes and CDs. This guy came and said, hey, my CD player isn't working. Could you look at it? Because he knew this fellow was good with electronics. And he says, the guy said, I think the needle's broken. broken. And the guy just kind of laughed. <laughs> no, no, CD players don't have needles. They have an electronic eye that reads the data off the disc and your eye is probably just dirty, and so he cleaned it off, and then it worked perfectly. What's the point? Our hearts spiritually can get so polluted with things that are not necessary, not important, that we can't see clearly. We can't understand what is really out there for God, that God has given to us. So we get distracted. Now, when you look back in uh, Matthew 13, he goes on, explains the parable of the sower. And you remember the, the Christian who hears the word and he, he, he grows up, and, and, but ne never bears any fruit. Jesus explains that person in verse 22. It's the thorny soil. On the one, verse 22, the one whom the seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word and the worry of the world the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. What happened to his heart? His heart got packed full of other stuff that was not important. They were okay in themselves, but they distracted him from seeing what really was important. Priorities. And so they never bore fruit. And that's really what Jesus is talking about here, that it's possible to get so distracted we miss really what's important. This was conditioned in Ezekiel. It says their hearts become rebellious. They don't want to listen. Sometimes it's just because we get uh, confused about really what God has given to us is, that is important. Now, I say all this because you have to understand that Jesus wrote to the same church himself in the book of Revelation. Do you remember that? And do you remember what he said to them in chapter 2 and verse 4 and 5 when Jesus wrote a letter to the Ephesians and Paul's praying that their eyes might be open? Here's what Jesus said. I have this against you. You've left your first love. Therefore, remember where you've fallen. Repent and do the deeds which you did at first. For else I'm coming to remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. So they had not opened their eyes, and it got so serious that Jesus saying, if you don't change, you might lose your relationship with me altogether. See, when your eyes are closed, 
We can become listless. We become lethargic spiritually. And what we do things, when we do things spiritually, we're apathetic about it. And they become just uh, ritual. And, and we're lukewarm. And, and sometimes when problems come up, we're dispirited. And we fall into different routines. And, and there's just no passion or zeal. And it's all signs of a heart packed full of the wrong things or a dull heart. And Paul's writing to Christians, and he says, I know that can happen, so my prayer that is your eyes will be opened. The truth will shine in your heart. You'll be enlightened. Literally, it means that you'll see what is to be seen. It's that aha moment where you say, I get it. <laughs> I, I finally get it. Now, that's what he's wanting for them. When we can simply say, Lord, I see what you're trying to tell me. My eyes have been open. So the question is then, what does Paul want us to see? Is there anything specific? Well, thankfully, in his prayer, he mentions three things. And these three things are important because they help us stay on the right spiritual track. And so we'll just answer those questions because there are really three things, as I mentioned, hope, glory, and power. Look with me again in his prayer in Ephesians chapter 1. And while you're turning back there, because I know you're already in Matthew and you're turning back to Ephesians, could you memorize these verses? Verse 18 and 19. Memorize them. Why? So this prayer can become your prayer. First of all, you could pray it for yourself. You change the pronouns from you to me. Lord, open my eyes that I might see. Then also, when you've done praying for yourself, it's appropriate to pray this prayer word for word for other Christians, family members, those that you love, that you think of them and you're thankful for them. Pray that the eyes of their heart may be enlightened so that they may know what is the hope of his calling. And in your prayer, we'd say, I pray that they might know what is the hope of your calling because you're talking to the Father, correct? And what are the Riches of the glory of the inheritance we have in the saints and the surpassing greatness of your power toward us, God, who believe. Let's look at those three things together, shall we? They're simple, but they're so impactful. First of all, he wants us to see the hope of his calling. The hope. Now, the word hope is used in our day like, well, I hope this would happen, but there's really not much promises of it ever coming about. It's sort of like someone saying, I hope the Packers win today, but there's really not much chance of that happening. So we hope means in that context, what? To wish. My wife's a big Packer fan. We have to watch it in separate rooms. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But that, I don't want to pack my full with things that aren't important because he's talking about spiritual things, right? I want you to know what the hope of his calling. See, God isn't calling us to just despondency lackadaisicalness, or just a, a sadness or melancholiness. He's not yeah, calling us to just an a, a, um, a average life. He's calling us to excel. He's calling us to, to joy and to peace. But most of all, he's calling us home. From God's perspective, Paul says, I want you to know what is the hope of his calling. The only thing that God wants out of this earth when it's said and done is you and me. And he said, really? That's all he wants? I said, well, of course. Well, what about this beautiful world we live in, the universe? There are literally billions of galaxies out there. And billions of stars. And God spoke them all. And, and we don't know, but there's probably even more planets out there. Maybe some just like ours. And God could create any man he want in a spoken word, couldn't he? They are meaningless to him when they're compared to you and me. You know what the hope of his calling is? It's you. It's me. That's all he wants. We are his offspring. And when he's writing to Christians, as he is here at Ephesus, we see back in chapter 1 and verse 5, he says, through his beloved son, we've been adopted We've been adopted by his grace. It's what he did for us. And we're now literally part of his family. And he just wants us to come home. Yeah. And that's our hope. 
And when we say hope, we're not saying, well, I think so, I hope so. No, we know so. And Paul says, I'm praying you just get that. You see that there's real purpose to this life because you've got a destiny. It's with God forever. And so now you live for him because you know you're going to live with him then. And all of a sudden it gives meaning to your life. It gives confidence to your life. It gives you the ability to overcome the trials and the problems. As the Russian poet write, to live without hope is to cease to live. He says hell is hopelessness. Dante's hell has a sign that says, abandon or leave all hope at the door. Because there's no hope in hell. But for us here on this earth, we have a confident expectation and, and we desire to be with our God. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, Peter echoes the exact same prayer, but he puts it not in a prayer, but just in a prayer to God. He said, blessed be God, because he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When we died with Christ and were buried with Christ and raised with Christ in baptism, we are adopted in his family and all of a sudden our names are written in the book of life. We have this hope that no one else shares except those that are in Christ. Paul said, I want your eyes to see that. You've got it made. And he says, furthermore, you're protected by the power of God, Peter says. Because you have this reservation in heaven, he says in verse 4, undefiled and uncorruptible, reserved for you. It's a living hope. Lord, open my eyes. Let me know what's really important. So I don't get distracted with things that really don't matter. Yeah, they, they make life easier. Paul's in prison. And he says, boy, if I even die, that's great. Because then, then I get to be with the Lord. See, death is the end of everything for so many people. But the revelation, we find that the writer says, blessed from now on those who die in the Lord. Well, why would you say happy are those who die in the Lord? Because they get to go home. There's no defeat in death. There's actually deliverance and victory. And that's what Paul says. I'm pit twixt between the two. I don't know if I should die and be with the Lord or stay here and work more for you. That's hope speaking. Not, you're untouchable by the world when you have this kind of hope. And we have a new year. And I'm fearful that as I get distracted by things, old age, my body, whatever it is, that my eyes get dulled or my heart gets packed full with things that are really not important. So my prayer for this new year, because we've been here in South Sam quite a long time, all of us collectively. I've been here, this is my 20th year. I'm like, where did that go? My prayer will be, let us, our eyes be open. We look at things afresh and anew. So we don't lose our first love. And we excel still more. And we remember and do the deeds we did once before. Because that's all that matters, isn't it? And we know that intuitively. But just like eating the Lord's Supper, if you were thinking about the game or something else, you were eating and drinking damnation to yourself. And that's because a heart gets so dull and packed with other stuff, we forget really what's important. And it's just the very reason we're here. Proverbs says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life. And that's what God offers us. The second thing he says about uh, the prayer is that he prays that we might know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saint. Now, there's a lot here, but I'm going to concentrate on the glory. So our inheritance is in heaven. It's to be able to go home because we're God's children and as God's children, we have an inheritance. Now, you say, well, I'm confused. You know, what do you mean inheritance? Well, do, don't fathers leave to their children an inheritance? So in Romans chapter 8, we see the same language that talking about how we are sons of God if we're led by the Spirit of God. And in verse 17 of chapter 8, if children were heirs also... Heirs of God, and here it is, fellow heirs with Christ. See, Jesus is the son of God, and we're sons of God, so we're brothers with Jesus, right? 
And whatever he is going to inherit, you can have a hope to inherit the same thing. So, well, no, 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 no. He's going to have something, a lot, lot, lot greater glory than I'll get. No, that's not what it says. Paul's saying, I want you to understand the riches of the glory of your inheritance is waiting for you. It's not so small thing. Well, how big is it? We're fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer him, in order that we may be glorified with him. The glory that Christ received, we will share in ourselves. You say, well, that's just too big to think. I'm not worthy of it. By grace, you have been saved. Now, in the Ephesians letter, we're going to pick through, Lord willing, throughout this next 12 months, some themes from the book of Ephesians. But one of them is in Ephesians 5. And we go there and it says, husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church. But the model is Christ and the church who loved her and gave himself up for her so that he might present her. Who's he talking about? Who's the her? You and me. We are his bride. Do you realize that? God's calling us home because the only thing he wants is you to be the bride of his beloved son. So Jesus loved her, gave himself up for her, that he might purify her and cleanse her so that he might present her, you, to him, it says, in all her glory. Now, who's worthy to be the bride of Christ? Anybody here? Yes, you are. Not only are you worthy, you're going to be. You are. He's espoused himself to you. And he won't break that commitment. He won't change his mind. And that's why we try to live like him now, because we know we're going to be his bride then. So the riches of his glory in chapter 3 of Ephesians, he says it's unsurpassable riches. You know, we can't even fathom. And, and Paul says the only thing I do is just pray that your eyes might be open. He says, you know, the suffering's. We go through on this earth, and Paul remembers in prison. He says, when you compare them to the glory, they're not even worthy to be shared together. They're not even worthy to be compared. And he goes on to say, this momentary, I love that, because sometimes it seems long-lasting, doesn't it? It's not momentary, our suffering on this earth. And he calls it light. No, sometimes it's heavy. When you have cancer, or there's been death, or there's illness, or there's divorce, or separation, that's not light. But compared to the glory, what does Paul say it is? It's light. When you get there, you go, man, that was easy. He said, no, I can't imagine that. That's why he said, I want your eyes to be opened. So you see this. He says, it's producing an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comprehension. So since you can't comprehend it, all Paul's left to do is pray that your eyes might be open. God's got to intervene and somehow get us to see it. So we finish then with the third part of his prayer. This gives us joy, by the way, and passion. A lot of people are missing passion, excitement in their life. But when you're expecting glory, just like you're expecting to go on a trip or a promotion or a new home, it gives excitement to your life, doesn't it? When we just get a small glimpse of the glory that is waiting for us, it gives you excitement and joy in this life right now and passion and purpose for living because you know what's awaiting you ahead. The third thing is, I said, I pray that the, you might know, know the surpassing greatness of the power towards us who believe. That's interesting. Us as Christians, the children of God, the future bride of Christ, and we're believers. The power is available to us when we believe. Now, what kind of power is we talking about? Well, he goes on to say in Ephesians that, notice verse uh, the end of verse 19. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. That's God's might. Well, what kind of power did God have? Which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead. How much power does it take to raise someone from the dead? I can't even imagine. Three days in the grave. And God reanimated somehow, put him back to life just like he did Lazarus, but Jesus never to die again. Not only that, 
It was power enough to raise it from the dead, then seat him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. That's the kind of resurrection power that's available to you and me if we just, what, have our eyes opened and then believe it. Well, what does that mean? Again, I want you to think about 1 Peter chapter 1 where we've been uh, talked about earlier that we've been born again to a living hope. Verse 4, to obtain inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Your name's on a reservation as a son of God, to be taken home in glory. Verse 5, you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed last time. This is the kind of power that's available to us. You're untouchable. Satan can't get you. The world can't get you. If your eyes are open and you just trust God and you want to go home more than anything else, you're untouchable. And so I can't get through this. Yes, you can. He says, well, I can't do what the Lord has asked me. Yes, you can. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Not all things I want to do, all things he wants me to do. That's the difference. I can persevere. I can continue as a Christian. I can overcome sin and temptation. If we just have our eyes open and realize what immense power, because God bought us at such terrible cost, this cost of his own son who was murdered on a cross. We are so valuable to us. He's not going to let us go easily. He gives us all the power we need, his power, resurrection power to overcome. There's no way we can fail. We just have our eyes open. And so we look at that. Paul says when he prayed for the own thorn in the flesh, whatever his problem was, Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you because power is perfected in weakness. And then what he says, God is saying, my power is perfected in your weakness. When you finally realize you can't do it yourself, you startly, finally start asking me to help you. I'm paraphrasing for God, excuse me. But God says, I've been waiting for you to stop trusting yourself, start trusting me. And when you start looking to me, that's when I'm going to help you. But when you're trying to do it all on your own, it's not going to get done. So Paul says... I'm content now with weaknesses and insults and distress and persecution, difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm really strong because Christ's strength is finally in me. So we look at this. Philippians chapter 4, Paul makes this promise. My God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Do you see that? Are your eyes open? That's his simple prayer. I'm going to ask you all to make that your prayer this week, this whole year, as we look at things afresh again. Look at why we're here and where we're going. It'll be nothing new, but Paul doesn't want us to lose our first love, but to excel still more with what we're doing right. So can we... Go to God now and make that prayer as Paul prayed for us. Our blessed Father in heaven, we give you all glory and praise because you have blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. And for this, we thank you. We give you praise and glory because we know that everything on this earth and in heaven is summed up in Jesus, your son. God, he is our identity. He is our purpose. He is our life. And without him, we would have nothing. For this, we thank you. And Lord, we confess to you, sometimes we become listless. Sometimes we become dull of hearing. Sometimes we get distracted by the wonderful things this world offers, and sometimes we get tempted and deceived by Satan's allurements. So, God, it is our humble prayer that you might open the eyes of our heart, that we might know the hope of your calling, that, Lord, we might know the riches of the glory you have for those your saints and God that we might know the power 
that is available to us if we'll just believe according to your glorious might, the same power that it took to raise your son. It is in him that we pray these things because he is our hope and he is our savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We're going to conclude with an invitation and what a better way to start a new year is by getting into Christ. If you're not a Christian and you've never been baptized into Christ, you have not participated in his resurrection. Paul says very clearly, do you not know those who us have been baptized have died with Christ and we have been buried with Christ? That's in, happens in baptism. Literally, spiritually, it happens. And just as Christ was raised to walk in newness of life, we are raised with him and added to his family to walk in a newness life, never to die again spiritually. We'll die physically, but we'll live with our Father forever and ever. If we can help you make that walk with God, won't you come? So we stand to sing the song that Eric.